welcome everyone. Thank you for being here and for your interest in our conversation today. Um, I'm Winnie Smith, the Associate Director of the Wilson Center for Humanities and Arts at the University of Georgia. This event is part of the Wilson Center's Global Georgia Initiative, a public event series that brings world-class thinkers to Georgia and in these days online. It presents global problems in local context by addressing pressing contemporary questions, including the economy, society, and the environment, with a focus on how the arts and humanities can intervene. This series is made possible by the support of our community and the Wilson Center Board of Friends. We at the Wilson Center are so thrilled to present the work of Hands House Studio again, this time on the Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project. I want to give a special thank you to our partners in the Lamar Dodd School of Art who have been working to connect their students with Hands House for future workshops. And I know you're eager to hear our panelists, so I promise to keep their intros brief. Hands House is a nonprofit, innovative educational organization that creates adventurous hands on projects with communities, institutions, and partners around the world as a way to illuminate history, understand science, and perpetuate the arts. Rick and Laura Brown are the co-founders of Hands House Studio, and they have worked together on a wide variety of sculpture, architecture, and educational collaborations since they met in 1970. They are both lifetime teachers and share a particular interest in teaching through a learn by doing approach in creating opportunities for community interaction and demonstrating the adventure of discovery by leading as fellow researchers and learners alongside their students. Rick Brown is a retired professor of sculpture at Massachusetts College of Art and Design, the recipient of numerous grants and distinguished teaching awards. He received a Master of Architecture from Harvard University Graduate School of Design, a Master of Fine Arts from Washington University School of Fine Arts, and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Georgia. For our Georgia audience, you will enjoy knowing that Rick and Laura met when they were at UGA at the Mayflower downtown. Thank you all for being here. Lindsay Cook is Assistant Teaching Professor of Art History in the School of Art at Ball State University and an architectural historian, translator, and digital preservation advocate. She earned her BA in Art History in French and Francophone Studies from Vassar College and her PhD from the Department of Art History and Archaeology at Columbia University. Her current book project, The Image of Notre Dame of Paris, considers the role of architectural and artistic response in the formation of an architectural icon. Gerald David owns and operates GFD Woodworking in Duluth, Minnesota, with a focus on designing and creating small residential timber frame structures. Gerald teaches his trade at North House Folk School in Grand Marais, Minnesota, and at Timber Framers Guild Projects. He also offers learning opportunities in his company, working with owners and employing craftspeople new to the trade. Gerald learned his trade in his native Aachen, Germany, moving to the United States after completing his Wanderschaft, a three-year traditional journey in the trade. Tanya Onstad is an assistant professor of architecture and planning at the Catholic University of America in DC. Her professional focus is understanding the expanding role of the designer as a global citizen in an era of massive change. She's interested in tectonics, materials, and the intersection of history, culture, and construction. The common thread in her practice is built around materials potential to impact the lives of its inhabitants and how buildings are stewarded. Tanya has a master's in architecture from Harvard Graduate School of Design and a dual bachelor of arts in architecture and French from the University of Minnesota. And finally, Marie Brown, who will moderate our discussion today, received her MFA in directing theater from the University of Texas at Austin and her BA in music and theater from the University of Puget Sound in Tacoma. She's a director, maker, and performer whose work focuses on innovative, multidisciplinary, and educational projects. Marie joined Hands House Studio in 2018 and was hired as the first executive director. She's also served Hands House on multiple projects through the years, such as the Toys for Elephants, excuse me, Toys for Elephants project in Thailand and the Gwadziek Synagogue project in Poland. I'm going to pass the baton to her and I'm going to disappear, but I will be back to help with Q&A after. If you have any questions for our panelists, please put them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you for introducing everyone. And so, um, 
to jump right in because we've got a lot to cover in our time here. We are gonna um, jump first to Rick Brown from Hans House Studio who will introduce Hans House and, and the, the project, the Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project. Okay, so um, first I'd like to thank everybody for, um, for joining us uh, today for this webinar. And then I also would like to thank uh, Winnie Smith and the Wilson Foundation for, as Winnie has already said, this is our second invite to, to share a, um, a Hans House project. This case is the most recent project. And so um, what I wanna do is I, I want to talk a little bit about Hans House uh, and uh, Winnie has already sort of started that, but I'm gonna do it with pictures. And then also I wanna talk about the, um, uh, a little bit about the project itself. So, um, the, uh, first, I'd like to say that, you know, I, I, I taught in college for 40 years, and if ever I were going to give a lecture that for some reason had to be cut short, I would never cut it short. What I would do is just talk faster. So bear with me. I'm going to be moving pretty quickly through this. So um, uh, the, uh, the title of our project, the Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project, you, you've heard that. So, um, okay, I'm, I'm not advancing here. Where does it go? Okay. There we go. Okay, so right just that way. Okay, so Hans House Studio in, uh, initiates adventures, hands on projects as a way to explore history, understand science, and perpetuate the arts. Let me, let me be sure I can uh, navigate this for some yeah. reason. It's over here. There we are. Okay. Okay, Hans House creates projects outside the traditional classroom. On the left, you'll see uh, where we built a replica of a uh, American Revolutionary War submarine for Discovery Channel. Uh, and then on the right, you're seeing a, uh, an image of a French crane that we built in a uh, six day workshop uh, that was uh, originally designed and built to build a bridge across the Loire River in Orléans, France in 1750. These are the kinds of projects we do at Hans House. Uh, Hans House energizes history through the reconstruction of historic objects. On the left, you're seeing a, uh, a group of faculty and students actually pouring a 300 pound cast iron bell in a four day workshop and on the right, we're building a, uh, a, 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 a Polish bell tower to actually install the bell. That was a bell tower built in, in, uh, in Poland in 1750. Okay, so uh, Hans House invites collaborations with educational organizations, institutions, and partners around the world. On the left, uh, you're seeing an image of where we built our American Revolutionary War submarine and then we were able to uh, test it in the United States Naval Academy state-of-the-art test tank. On the right, you see a human-powered crane that was originally built in the 1400s uh, in the Czech Republic. And uh, we built this with the timber framers from all around the world. And, uh, and then the next summer, we came back and uh, installed the crane on a castle outside of Prague to do an authentic castle restoration. Uh, our projects provide students the opportunity to work side by side with scholars, historians, architects, hit artists, and traditional builders in a wide range of subjects. On the left, you're seeing uh, where we were invited by uh, PBS's Nova to raise an obelisk using Egyptian technology. On the right, you're seeing uh, an image with Rabbi Shudrick. He's the rabbi of Poland, and he's authenticating Hebrew text for the Gavorgis Synagogue ceiling painting project we did in, in Poland. Hans House participants become an integral part of a learning collective. This is a very important part of how we work, the learning collective. What you're seeing here are, again, timber framers who've come from around the countries around the globe, working with the US students and students in Poland, replicating the 17th century Gavorgis Synagogue roof structure. Uh, here you're seeing uh, the replication of the 17th century Gavorgis synagogue ceiling painting, which is part of that same project in, in, uh, in Poland. Here we are. Uh, 
Okay, here we are. The, uh, actually, what we do is we go through this process of doing research and then actually building a, uh, an object. And the people who participate in that get that dynamic uh, learning experience working together. And then after that, there's an exhibition story that follows. In this case, at, you'll see uh, on the left-hand side, after we built the Bushnell turtle submarine replica, we, uh, for, the, for the Discovery Channel film, then uh, we gave the uh, International Spy Museum our submarine for their, their permanent collection. On the right, you're seeing a similar uh, process where school children observing the Gavorgic synagogue ceiling painting in the Poland Museum of the History of Polish Jews in, uh, in Warsaw, Poland. Okay, so now, uh, Notre Dame in pa de Paris is one of the most widely recognized symbols of France and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. In this image uh, that we just saw, you saw the, uh, the cathedral before the fire. Okay, so in April 15, 2019, the roof of Notre Dame caught fire. We all saw this on television in shock. The entire timber frame structure supporting the roof above the stone vaulted ceiling was destroyed. And the La Forêt, you have to click it, uh, is a wooden framework of the roof, roof hidden above the cathedral vaulting known as La Forêt, uh, the forest in English, uh, because, you have to click it again, because there's more than 1,300 oak trees that were needed for its completion. So this image you're seeing here is the, uh, is the roof structure before the fire. Uh, at Hans House, we knew if we're going to do a project to replicate one of these trusses from the Notre Dame Cathedral, we're going to have to make some sort of relationship with an organization in France. Carpenters Without Borders is a French organization that brings together passionate carpenters to preserve traditional skills and practices. In 2020, Carpenters Without Borders built and raised a full-scale reconstruction of choir trust number seven, the one you're seeing here in the photograph on the right. They were demonstrating to the French community that rebuilding the La Forêt using traditional methods of the original builders is possible today. That's because there were many skeptics in France that didn't believe that in fact there were traditional carpenters that could do this. Hans House reached out to Carpenters Without Borders in support of their work. And with our similar missions, Hans House Studio and Carpenters Without Borders forged a partnership. We proposed that Hans House make a full-scale reconstruction of one of the trusses of the La Forêt using uh, similar tools and technology of the original makers. The Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project, uh, the goal is of, this, of this project is to bring our educational mission to the task of recovering the priceless heritage lost in the fire in 2019. Thanks to our incredible community, that's timber framers and professionals around the country and, and educators, it has blossomed into another significant collaboration led by Hans House Studio. We believe collaboration is intrinsic to revive this iconic edifice and acknowledges the impact of the loss of cultural heritage. Our project is a statement of solidarity with fellow makers and an act of goodwill among neighbors. We wish to share our choir trust reconstruction as a gift from America to France and the collective effort around the world to rebuild the cathedral. Okay, so the Notre Dame Trust Reconstruction Workshop in DC uh, happened last summer with official drawings created by French lead architects, Rémi Fremont and Cédric Transot and using the materials and methods of the original uh, medieval builders. Hans South brought together traditional carpenters, faculty and students from around the US to build trust number six in a 10 day workshop at the Catholic University of America in Washington, DC. Okay, participants use the kinds of tools, materials and processes of the original makers to learn how, who and why it was made. Our process seeks to illuminate the cultural value of traditional building practices and to illuminate an understanding of history of culture embodied in the building of the cathedral and to illuminate the genius of the maker. And this project embodies a lot of lessons, but one of the most important things we hear is this is a carpenter's project. The trust was hand raised on the grounds of Catholic University 
campus in the shadow of the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. You see that uh, the, the shrine behind our trust. Cardinal Wilton Gregory, who's also the chancellor of the university, blessed the trust and joined in to help with the lift. This, so here you see our uh, professional timber framers and students uh, that all have completed the trust in front of the basilica. Okay, choir and trust number six was reassembled and raised on the National Mall for public viewing in partnership with the Historic Preservation Training Center of the National Park Service on August 5th, 2021. You can see this is a very proud moment for us that now we've built the trust and we've raised it on, on the, uh, the National Mall, the, you know, the front yard of, of America. And in between, as you can see, the Washington Monument and the uh, Capitol Building. Then the Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project was exhibited inside the National Building Museum's Great Hall, August, September through September through 2021. So now we've exhibited in three major high profile venues, really expressing the, uh, this idea that this is an American trust that we want to give to, we'd like to give to France. La Forêt Model Project is a hand sound that studio has invited colleges and university faculty and students to build a scale model of the Notre Dame Choir, some of the oldest trusses that stood above the cathedral's roof structure. Okay, now the participating uh, institutions so far are the Catholic University of America in DC, Florida State University, Washington University in St. Louis, Virginia Tech's Washington Alexandria Architecture Center, known as WAC, uh, MIT in Cambridge, Mass, North Bend Street School in Boston, Mass, and Gordon College in Massachusetts. Now, uh, currently, the Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project is on display in the open air exhibition at the Millennium Gate Museum in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's going on from March 7th through April 25th. And we're offering a day of demonstrations and presentations on April 24th, 3 to 6 p.m. And I hope everybody who's listening to this will be able to come and visit us for that, uh, that opening. Thank you very much. So we'll pass this on at this point. So as you've heard, Hans House is all about collaboration. And so it's perfect that in this situation, we have the full panel of, of some of the many experts. I will, will note there are so many that are not here that have been critical to this piece. Um, but right now, what we're gonna do is pass it on to Lindsay Cook, who's gonna talk about the historical background of this and her own experience in, in really deeply researching Notre Dame de Paris. Thanks so much, Marie, and, and thanks to everyone, including Winnie Smith and everyone at Hands House for having me here today. I'm really excited to talk about um, sort of my uh, context for coming at this from a historical vantage point and thinking about putting the Notre Dame de Paris Trust Project in a bit of context. So what I'm going to discuss is specifically uh, the Notre Dame roof in its original historical context. You're seeing here an image on the left, which shows um, a view from the Ile Saint-Louis taken not long before the fire in 2017. I believe I took that photograph. And on the right, you're seeing an image of the roof structure itself, the roof framework um, above the vaults. As you can see, we're looking at the tops of the stone vaults and into the roof structure. The material that I'm going to be presenting today, and especially at the beginning, comes from a book that was published originally in French in 2013 by Andrew Tallon, my mentor, um, and Danny Sondron, who's a professor at the Sorbonne in Paris. Um, and I was lucky enough to be the translator of the book when it came out in an English edition in 2020. So you're seeing that on the right. And so if you miss anything in what I'm about to tell you about the, the history and the earlier iterations of the cathedral, you'll find it in this book, Notre Dame Cathedral, Nine Centuries of History. Now, Notre Dame of Paris, we might think of it as in its state, as it was in 2019 when the fire occurred, but it was a building that was very much in time and one that transformed uh, dramatically over the course of the Middle Ages and well into the 19th century. You're seeing here that early 
the earliest iteration of the building as it is constructed, beginning around in the 1160s or so, or thereabouts, um, and starting from the east end, so with the most sort of sacred part of the building being constructed first. The cathedral was not an ex novo building. There was already a cathedral here in place on the site. And so it was also um, to sort of accommodate the existing structure that it was started at this part at the East End. We have a document from 1177 that makes it clear that by this point, the cathedral was finished or meaning the East End of the cathedral was finished up to and accepting the vaults. So everything except for the stone vaults would have been finished on this East End or the Chevet by 1177. And that, important for us to consider today, would include the original wooden roof. So you're seeing that the roof framework was constructed and the lead um, added to the roof uh, itself before the stone vaults down below were built. This relates an important point about Gothic cathedrals in general, which is that there's a structural independence between the stone vaults down below and the wooden roof trusses up above. And so the, nothing demonstrates that better than seeing that here is the cathedral without its vaults down below. Construction then pr processed, uh, progressed rather uh, westward. And you can see that it was a, a bit of a sort of pile and uh, until about the year 1245, when, by which uh, point we know that there were bells installed in the great west towers um, at the west end of the building. There was also a roof added to the nave and to the transept as it was put up at this time. And if you look at that image in 1245, you could imagine that the cathedral is finished that it must be done at that point. But if you look closely, you'll notice that some of the most iconic elements of the cathedral that we know today, including its great stained glass windows on the north and south transept facades, or the spire that we now think of as being missing from the building, these were not added until the second half of the 13th century. So a radical transformation took place just at the moment where you, when you might actually think the building was finished. Alongside that important retrofit, which encompassed things like I was just saying, the uh, transept facades, the clear story windows were transformed at that time too. This is also when the roof is completely changed. Um, and so there's a new roof added at this point. For a long time, it was thought that this was because of a fire that occurred um, at some point in the 13th century. And I think our research has led us to, to wonder about this and to reconsider whether that was really the impetus for the construction of a new roof. It's also when the spire was added. Um, and if you look closely, what you'll notice is that this spire, this medieval spire, is not actually the same one that we might be more familiar with from later days. More on that in just a second. This evocative photograph, we're, we're very lucky because the cathedral changed uh, really dramatically, again, not only in the late Middle Ages, but also again in the 19th century during a radical transformation to the building, a, a, a major restoration campaign overseen by two restoration architects, one named um, uh, Jean-Baptiste Lassus and the other Eugène-Emmanuel Viollet-le-Duc. And over the course of the 1840s to 1860s, they uh, took their hand and, and their design sensibility to this building, presenting new stones, substituting new stones in many cases uh, for old ones. Not only stones though, I would say this is often what gets um, uh, more attention in the literature and in scholarship and even maybe in the popular imagination. Things like the stone gargoyles, pseudo gargoyles that were added or chimeras that were added in the middle of the 19th century. This is maybe what comes to mind about that transformation in the popular imagination. But at the same time too, the roof structure itself was also changed and restored. What we're looking at here is an image from basically very early on in the restoration campaign. So you can see the building more or less as it was when the two restoration architects took over. What you'll notice is that the spire is gone. So that medieval spire, all that remained of it, it had been dismantled in the 18th century. And all that remained of it at this point was the base of the spire. So you can see some elements, some bits of the carpentry down here sort of sticking out um, from the roof line, but otherwise it had been already truncated and removed from the building. 
If you look closely here, sort of comparing it to what we were just looking at before, if you notice the far east end, we have this sort of spindly vertical element made of metal, but it's hard to make out exactly what is there. If we move ahead one slide, what we find is that you can see that the roof, even if this is hard to perceive unless you're looking for it, that the roof is also being restored. Um, and this is not the entire thing in, in the way that the stone often is completely uh, substituted, new stone substituted for old. The roof and said there's a more sort of um, with surgical precision, they transform, especially the top of the roof and add metalwork, this metalwork band also that runs along top and across here at the top as well. The two restoration architects also determine that they are going to restore the spire. And at first, they think that they will restore it more or less in the same way that it looked, having a similar profile to the medieval iteration of the spire. But once Lassus, the more, more senior architect, dies, Ville le Duc decides to um, enact a much more dramatic, radical transformation to this spire, making it um, much larger than it originally was. This is the spire that we know if we've seen the cathedral in our own lifetimes. So here you see it going up. And you can also um, notice in this image facing um, eastward that the transepts also, the, the roofs of the transepts have also been re-leaded here. Um, and also we know from other drawings that also some details have been sort of grafted into the top of the roof structure, the wooden roof framework down below. This continues westward until the roof has been restored completely, and it's been visible um, in later images that we have of the cathedral. Resulting in what we know um, to be the state of the building before the fire. So we've seen this image previously, and there we have it. Very much um, an accretion, not only of the uh, 12th and 13th and 14th centuries, but also importantly of the 19th century as well. Now we know already Rick has presented this, so I won't dwell on this too much, but we know that what um, the fire damaged more than anything else in the cathedral was the roof itself, which is truly lost at the end of the day. And you can see here just the uh, smoldering remains of the roof um, silhouetted by the stone gables that still stood at the end of the day. The question then becomes how to piece things back together. And I would say I just want to end by pointing out a couple of kinds of documentation that do exist and that Hans House has been exploiting um, and using to all of our benefit in order to recreate trusses from Notre Dame. Of course, photography is an important piece of this, especially um, really good photography. This is a good example of a well-lit photograph that does give a sense of the, the craftsmanship that went into the original carpentry. There was also a laser survey made in 2010 and also another uh, survey simply of the roof and those have been stitched together to form a composite model, which is now um, hosted by the CNRS, which is an important, um, the National Center for Scientific Research in Paris. And all of these can be uh, sort of toggle back and forth between the pre-fire and post-fire laser scans or states of the building. Really useful for obviously scholarly research, but also for a project like the one that Hans House is undertaking um, to reconstitute and reconstruct uh, individual roof trusses from the cathedral. Just to give you a sense of which trusses it is that are at issue here, um, you heard tell of Car Carpenters Without Borders reconstructing um, choir truss seven. So here you're seeing the cross uh, tie the lower cord of truss seven, and here's truss six um, on this plan, likewise from the uh, composite model from the CNRS. And we can also imagine that we're back in this space. Um, this is something that the laser scan uh, allows us to do is to travel inside the space between the vaults and the roof. An eerie experience now that it really is missing. 
But one other kind of documentation that exists is the survey by Fromont and Trentezeau, and this is something that I would say um, has been extremely important and is really the crucial document because you have not only um, beautiful hand-drawn surveys by these two um, architects, but you also have their um, observations that they made while they were in the space before it was destroyed. So with that, I think I will pass it on to the next, um, the next person, throw it back to Marie. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a perfect segue. You, you ended on the, the, the hand drawings of the, the apps in that case. Um, and so we're going to pass it over to Gerald David, who, is, as, as the timber frame expert, is going to speak more specifically about the timber frame as well as the, the workshop that we, were, uh, we did in D.C. Um, I might might as well just go ahead. Um, I'm going to share my screen right here, and I'm going to hit. Uh, hit play. So, um, uh, so I, I should also say thank you to Hans House and to the Wilson Center for uh, for inviting me and all of you for coming and listening and watching. Um, and I also definitely have to chair, uh, thank all the craftspeople that I have learned from in my 20 year career. And um, it is in that spirit that I participated in uh, this project and other projects uh, of Hans House um, and uh, to share what I've learned and to pass it on to the next generation. Um, uh, the, uh, um, as I'm going to talk about uh, a pro our project about uh, actually recreating uh, trust number six, acquire trust number six, um, yeah, we, we had to start by creating drawings and we worked uh, very much uh, off of that, those survey drawings um, <clears throat> that uh, Lindsay uh, just uh, showed, and um, I have a slight uh, correction to make where um, the trust that uh, um, the Charpentier Sans Frontières built was a nave truss, um, number seven. So uh, a good ways down the cathedral, um, what, uh, what these drawings that, that uh, Trentesseau and uh, Fromont uh, made and gave us uh, showed was a development and, uh, of uh, trust design uh, in the process as they were building it. And um, the reason that they chose number seven of the nave and we chose, or they suggested that we choose number six of the choir was that this design uh, represented a point in the evolution that uh, the original builders repeated for the remainder of that section of the cathedral uh, very closely. So, um, we worked off of uh, that source material, lots of detailed drawings that allowed us uh, to figure out what uh, type of joinery um, uh, was used in the, in the different uh, locations. Um, but a flat drawing like this doesn't really uh, lend you uh, the understanding of uh, what we're actually building. Um, and so I used, uh, I work in SketchUp for, for a lot of my plans, and I use SketchUp to create a th three-dimensional drawing that then turned back into uh, uh, the plan sets. And uh, I just have this little animation to show the different uh, locations, the joinery. Um, and on all of these uh, uh, places, um, all of these uh, joints, there was much discussion as to how big the joints are, uh, what dimensions are, whether we use metric, whether we use uh, feet and inches. We ended up using feet and inches. And um, yeah, where, for example, uh, and, and, and uh, what, what particular shape um, joinery takes. Um, so that, after much discussion, many Zoom calls led to um, uh, a set of drawings and uh, a, a limited set of drawings. That was also the, 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 the question of how many drawings do we need? Um, there were six panels. Um, first, uh, with the names of things, uh, so that when we talk about it, we know what we're talking about, what the French talked about, uh, what their name for it is, what our name for it is. 
and then also a few three-dimensional renderings to um, show what the uh, uh, what what particular joinery looks like. Um, two panels showing uh, dimensions of the six. The the right-hand one here showing the consoles below the tie beam, which is that. Uh, the big massive beam on the bottom of the triangle. Um, we did not build those. Um, we had material for it. We decided we wouldn't be able to raise them and they'd be more confusing uh, in the exhibition than, than actually helpful. Um, and then the last two panels uh, are the description of the joinery, once in, in words, calling out uh, how wide uh, a, a mortise is, how deep it is, and um, and, and other, uh, other uh, things. And then to the right, the panel that might be, the, might have been the most helpful in, in uh, uh, describing how, how this thing is gonna go together with uh, yeah, blown apart uh, joinery drawings. Then on the first day, that's how that looked, a uh, piece of plywood on a, on a, on a cart and, and uh, uh, Introduction of the plans of the trust to the to the uh, crew, a crew of uh, at least twenty five excellent professionals, and then uh, many uh, people young in the trade, um, and also uh, architecture students from uh, the University of uh, the Catholic University of, of America in Washington, where this uh, took place. Um, first things first, you got to set up the site. Um, it's a critical to a good start and a good finish um, and requires a lot of uh, advanced planning. Um, thankfully, that was uh, not necessarily in my wheelhouse. And uh, but um, yeah, uh, things have to uh, be taken into account. First of all, how big the truss is and um, yeah, where it's where it's going to land. So to give you an idea, it's 46 feet wide at the at the base. Um, when it stands up, it's uh, over the 31 foot tall because it's on bunks. So because there are, uh, there are, yeah, there's about two feet of clearance you need for these uh, uh, parts of the queen posts that hang below. So across from the basilica, um, we stepped out or put a tape in the grass uh, for where actually the three points of that truss were, where it's gonna be assembled in the flat. And then to the right, you see, um, you have to also take into account that the thing is going to be raised. What's the background going to be? Of course, the basilica. And then are there, is there going to be enough room for the sandbags and, uh, and the ropes and the, the crews that, that need to pull this thing up? So on day one of production, which was another one or two days later from, uh, from when we figured out where to put this, uh, the logs were placed with a big crane, and uh, you can see the tie beam, the biggest, uh, that 46 foot log um, on day one without much uh, of it having happened to it. And then on the right, where it's at the base of a finished truss, and it hasn't really moved much in the 10, 12 days that it took from, from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. So then you could argue that making a truss is pretty simple. Um, I, I saw this set about baseball. You know, you hew the beam, you scribe the beam, you cut the beam, and then you put it together, and then you repeat it um, as many times as it takes. Uh, somebody asked um, how it would feel, how would it, whether it would be daunting to uh, build the whole cathedral rather than just one truss, and. Um, I, I, my thought around that was, well, once you've once you've built one. Um, you just have to, you know that you can do it and you just have to have to, you know, keep your crew going for the other 25 odd trusses that are in there, which might be the, the bigger challenge. You start out with hewing when you want to make a truss that's hand hewn. Um, you, you peel the logs, which um, reveals the shape of the timber uh, a little cleaner, uh, but it also takes away some of the dirt that comes from uh, the logs being pulled out of the out of the forest and it keeps your axis a little bit sharper and you can snap nicer lines onto the timbers which are the lines that you hew to as is often uh, uh, spoken more often spoken than than actually done so um, and you use uh, uh, a level to um, 
lay out the cross section of the timber that you want to end up with on the ends, both ends of the of the timber. That way they're in wind, you snap the lines between and you uh, work towards uh, re pulling out of the beam, uh, out of the log, the beam that you want to end up with. Um, the first part of hewing is joggling then, or let's say the second one after layout. You cut V notches down to those lines and uh, then hopefully uh, dislodge larger chunks, the joggles in between those V notches uh, reasonably efficiently. And then you, um, in the in the next step, use a broad axe to uh, clean up that uh, first rough hewn face and make it nice and smooth. And on the left, again, you see a very veteran uh, woodworker, hewer, and uh, on the on the right is uh, a person much much younger in the trade. And uh, I don't know how much experience she has, but uh, she's doing an excellent job from what I'm seeing just on this picture. And then the goal is to end up with something as beautiful as this. Um, beautiful, um, smooth faces, nothing but axes have uh, touched this, uh, this timber. And then uh, do two sides first and then flip it on its side um, and uh, do, the, do the other two sides to end up with the size beam that you need. Um, it doesn't necessarily always end up uh, straight because uh, when you, take only a part of the tree, um, certain tensions in the tree sometimes uh, cause the beam to, to, to be slightly bowed and you deal with that later. Um, you hew the beam, you scribe the beam, that's the next step. And um, so for scribing, you set up uh, two timbers that, that intersect and you stack them on top of each other. The lines that you see on these timbers uh, are used to um, uh, set the beams level so that they're exactly on top of each other. Uh, the plumb bobs that you see um, give you the reference of uh, what's exactly vertical one on top of the other. And the goal is to um, join the two timbers with their irregular, irregular uh, hewn surfaces to make a tight joint. Um, the other tool that's often used and traditionally used are the dividers, uh, much older than any kind of ruler or tape measure than uh, that we use today, but uh, very accurate in transferring uh, lengths. And then on the right, you see a, uh, a scribe joint uh, before it is taken apart, and, um, but it's marked for cutting. So then you come to the next step, you cut the beam. So you cut joinery. Uh, we used nothing but hand tools. Um, and um, yeah, your mallet and chisel, um, a broad axe or a broad hatchet uh, is also used to, uh, to take, take away some material a little bit finer. Um, drilling holes for the pegs. And uh, the, the frame saw is probably a little more, more modern than the, than the 12th century, but um, it's a hand tool nonetheless. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, as long as it was uh, um, a non-power tool, um, I think we used quite a range, uh, depending on what people brought. And those people collect in the present day, so they have a lot of old stuff, but nobody has a 12th century axe. Then it comes to assemblies. And uh, this frame, or this, this truss came together in four major steps of assemblies. First, the big triangle, so the two rafters and the big tie beam. Um, and there's a, there's a little bit of a taper in there. The biggest cross section is 10 by 17 in the center, 10 by 13 on the edges. The rafters themselves are about seven by seven. So a little, a little bit smaller, skinnier. Then the second one is the top right. Uh, the three collar beams get, get joined in um, with the mortise and tenon joints. Uh, next come the three um, vertical pieces, the queen posts and, and that little king post in there. And uh, lastly, uh, the remaining pieces, the upper cords of, of what looks like queen post truss and uh, the little straining beams in between and the little braces between one of the collar and the, the upright uh, queen posts. Um, the, uh, the queen post, so the two vertical on either side of uh, that little king post in the center and um, as well as the upper cords, so the, the um, more on a 45 degree diagonal angle pieces, they are double pieces. So they're two timbers that clasp around um, the timbers that they intersect. 
it was a very interesting um, uh, solution that, that the builders found and we'll see more pictures of it. So assemblies happen in people power. Um, these beams are not light, they're fresh green oak. Um, and uh, so they're, they're quite heavy. So you need enough people to move it without straining. Uh, the ground is not level, so we had a bunch of bunking to um, uh, build up and support the beams, make them level so that our process works with the uh, scribing using a plumb bob and basically uh, the vertical. So um, timber carts on the right are a very useful tool. They take most of the weight and then um, uh, just enough people to, uh, to move the beams to where uh, they need to be lined up to be scribed. So that's what's happening in the right-hand side. Um, I mentioned that the beams not, don't necessarily come out straight when they're, uh, when they're hewn. We follow the line, but then the, the, the timber bends because of internal stress. So on the left, you see um, them putting up a, a, a little post and a, and a, and a come along, basically a, a, a ratchet strap, a big strong ratchet strap that builds a little truss within that little beam to, to straighten it out. Um, you see that same setup on the right. Um, the, 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 the rafter is, is, is pushed straight um, with that setup. And then the collar beams are laid on top, ready for scribing. Um, the last uh, big uh, scribe was for these upper cords. And you can see on the left, the two uh, clasping beams, they're, they're uh, held together with um, ratchet straps on the ends, but also in, in, the, in the middle um, with two clavettes, which are uh, these, these wonderful uh, through tenons, um, uh, almost like wooden nails with a wedge that lock, uh, locked uh, the two timbers together. Um, and then they need to be scribed for tenons on the bottom and at the top, and then for uh, the, one of the collars to poke through the middle at a half span, that's where uh, the, the carpenter uh, there is doing, currently doing the, in this picture, doing the scribing. Uh, the big final assembly, again, I said that big beam didn't move much um, after it was hewn. Um, so uh, that big the tie beam lay flat on its side, all the joinery cut, and um, then the rest of the truss had to be brought into it. So that's why um, everybody was, uh, was ready and listening to Alicia in the center, making sure everybody moves at the same time. Other fun stuff happened. Um, pit sawing. This is to uh, a, a very traditional um, way to uh, create smaller uh, cross-section timbers um, quicker so that they're not hewn out of, out of small sticks. That, that becomes impractical. And then the two-man crosscut saw, uh, I think in this, the piece that we're uh, breaking off was then split up for, um, for, for, for pegs. Um, and then uh, another thing that we explored was splitting timbers, splitting timbers with axes. Uh, like I said, uh, several um, of the members of the truss are doubled up and it was unclear uh, from the um, survey whether or not um, these mating pieces were uh, taken out of one piece, split, and then joined back up again. Um, we decided to try it and, um, and, and had some actually uh, very beautiful results and, and just very interesting to try it with, uh, with oak. It worked well. Other fun stuff. Um, there was a lot of cleanup that had to happen. And uh, yeah, Bogo Hobel wird da fallen Späne is what you say in Germany, uh, where you, uh, uh, where you plain there will be shavings. Uh, so uh, we filled that dumpster uh, easily. And we had a whole lot of help from um, a lot of the, the, I'll call them volunteers, the participants of the, um, of the, of, of Tanya Onstedt's class. Um, of course, and um, yeah, even at the end of the day, look at them smiling. Um, it was it was a blessing having having uh, just the, the whole crew on on site. Uh, last thing um, to do was to create some A frames uh, for the rigging uh, to to stand the the truss up. 
Uh, they were hewn out of uh, some pine, I believe, and um, which went a little bit faster. Um, and uh, that was the, uh, the purview of, of Greg Mullen uh, to figure out how to, how to stand this up, uh, many ropes and uh, straps. And uh, they have done many, many raisings. Uh, they're the quietest, most authoritative people, um, impressive uh, at, at, at just what they do. And um, yeah, get a lot of people on the ropes. And um, once the thing stands, um, it is tradition to send uh, the youngest carpenter that worked on the project up to the, uh, to the peak to install the wedding bush. and. Uh, uh, honor the forest that uh, the, the trees came from. And uh, yeah, by us doing that, we're honoring the tradition of uh, teaching new people in the trade and giving them responsibility. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Um, we, are, uh, we are getting close to the end here. So we might, um, if it's possible, we might go over a little. Is that okay, Tanya? Are you able to, I know you're, okay. So we might go over a little time because I know Tanya um, has her presentation about uh, working with her students at, at Catholic University uh, doing both La Flore model project, which she initiated as a, a summer class prior to the workshop. And then they folded in and joined the workshop getting big tools and full scale model uh, experience working with the timber framers. Um, so Tanya, I'll let you take it away. Can you hear me? Great. Um, so yes, this was a really incredible experience. And um, let me just say, um, as the others have said, thank you to everyone um, who um, has made this um, happen today, but also um, a really big thank you to the students. I think there's a couple of them in the audience now and the um, university and the Dean and everyone who, who really um, push this forward and super thank you to Hans House for, for starting it all. So um, this project, you know, of course, as you've heard people say, the loss of this, this uh, roof in 2019 um, was, you know, devastating, it was complete, and it was really more than uh, just a material loss. Um, it destroyed a forest of trees, generations of building technology, and uh, truly an un unimaginable amount of human spirit and embodied energy in the structure. Um, this was and is an opportunity to be part of the reconstruction, demonstration, and passing on of, of intangible heritage and tectonic knowledge. So um, I have to move Marie here. I see her in the middle of my notes. So um, over the course of uh, six weeks, students worked to tell the story of Notre Dame de Paris through a series of, um, the, through the, full-scale reconstruction, but also some work beforehand and an exhibition and drawings, models, et cetera. Students had four weeks before the workshop started to really think about the joinery, craftsmanship, um, and history behind the truss um, before the logs were delivered. Students made many models of Notre Dame and truss number six, um, or of Notre, of Notre Dame and also truss number six, where it was located in increasing scale and complexity. As you see in this image on the right, you see the, um, some of the official draw drawings um, from the French architects that, that Lindsay spoke about earlier. And on the left, um, some of the student work as we went from 3D models um, in bass, um, 3D printed models, and, and eventually into white oak. Um, here you also see a drawing, um, the student version of Jerry's drawing. So um, where we're learning to um, understand what these um, different uh, joinery pieces, um, how this was really operating. We wanted to be as ready as we could before we met all these very experienced timber framers. Um, so these are the, that, this is the truss. Um, students produced exquisite hand drawings, ink washes, and research panels that were displayed um, at our own um, exhibition of space called Miller at the Architecture School of Architecture and Planning at Catholic University, but it was also all mu much of it was plucked by um, Nash the National Building Museum and, and presented at the National Building Museum alongside the, the truss or below the truss, really. Yeah. So a series of scholars um, contributed lectures and demonstrated demonstrating the larger um, Gothic architecture picture. People like Lindsay, um, um, people that 
um, talked about medieval construction management, um, people that spoke about Notre Dame's socio-cultural context, details of its trusses, dendrochronology, everything from past, and we even thought about future potentials of timber. Um, so once students practice the joinery, they worked to place that one to 10 scale model together. Here you see them working um, to try to figure out that assembly method that Jerry was just speaking about um, and trying to figure out how to scribe and coordinate um, that assembly. Of course, this was in white oak. If there's any architecture students here, you may never have used white oak. So it's a whole different um, process and was a really exciting um, learning curve. Um, this effort sort of mimicked that of the full scale trust in this assembly. It prepared students to jump. We hoped it prepared students to jump and scale. Um, students applied these structural lessons as well with a coordinated effort to raise a half scale truss uh, with a rigging engineer um, who was um, also a really important part of this project. Um, on site, they were guided through the process, of course, of debarking, joggling, notching, hewing, and scribing. So here's an image of the, uh, or a series of images of how we, um, Professor Greg Mullen uh, built a half scale truss and the students then worked to demonstrate the power of sort of collaboration and really kind of practice this well well oiled um, machine for the the raisings um, beforehand so they work together on that um, like you've seen these images but some of these images of how it began once we got four weeks in that full scale um, full scale workshop uh, that hans house has coordinated was began on july 26th and that's when 30 of these white oaks were delivered and um, the student this is when student research led to the sort of moment to really engage the hans house team timber framers, enthusiasts, and all kinds of academics right there on site. It was very exciting. Um, and the thing that was really exciting here was having students working with people like Jerry and other you know, really skilled framers that had been, have, have so much experience. It was really incredible moments of, of learning and pause and um, uh, even in the heat. So we started out in these red shirts that sort of indicated that we were proud of, of, of where our, our level and what we were learning, but we quickly advanced um, and, and got way too warm to wear them forever. Um, and we got into these crew shirts um, before long. So there was a really beautiful fellowship um, between student and teacher that connected what I thought was a really powerful part of this project, which was connecting the builder and the architect, the teacher and the students past and present in a really powerful um, experience. So here you see some of those, some of the, the, uh, the, raw, the raw material to lumber. Um, students felt really a lot of ownership, pride, and camaraderie. Here you see the, the axes that Hans House um, had made from uh, the French um, blacksmiths that came, that, that showed up on site. Um, and there was a lot of camaraderie. Um, the students took, uh, took on this, tried to take on pieces together and, and really, um, while they were, they came in equipped at the beginning before you knew it in four weeks, they were kind of ready for this beginning. So um, what they really, one of the sort of powerful pieces of this was that there was a reciprocity between, it wasn't just um, craftsperson giving lessons to students, but there was, I believe, a reciprocity that um, students also were able to sort of tell a larger story, part of the larger story um, back to the, the team and the group. So this one to 10 scale model, which you see the truss right there kind of in the middle, sitting on a one to 10 scale plan of, of Notre Dame, um, which was located, and you can see it's sitting as a primary truss with its, a sort of set of its secondary trusses together um, in the right position, um, too low, but in the right place. Um, uh, so the students work to kind of create and tell a further story as um, of the, combining all the pieces um, together. So you see the drawings and the models, you see the joinery pieces, and also you see sort of the, the story of the placement of the trust in some of these other models. So um, the objectives of this course included, included understanding the history of Notre Dame, its construction timeline, historical conditions, Gothic architecture and its context, et cetera. Um, it was also important for them to understand the raw material to dimensional, the story of the how it moved from raw material to dimensional lumber, as well as those assembly techniques. Um, its central goal, of course, was to sort of understand how details, one small, humble um, piece, you know, you can't imagine that one, one truss in this massive trusses 
can tell the larger story um, to to really get people into and understand both timber framing and, and the history of the cathedral. So here's some more of the work. Um, here are some of the small pieces on the left of, as they worked through understanding the joinery and of course the connection of the trusses and um, some of these models that explain where the truss sits. Um, there was a lot of drawings, a lot of gifts and a lot of um, time spent there. So I, one, one last thing before a couple of images. Um, one is to show that the, it was, it was really powerful also to work at the base of the basilica where you could hear the tile, not only because it was incredibly warm, but also because this, um, you could hear the time being um, calculated for you. Every 15 minutes was to you were you were reminded as the sort of beat of the clock of, of the clock and the sound of the axes and the the chiming of the you could hear the time go. So it was really quite neat. Um, I have a lot of pictures of Jerry actually, so I probably should send them to you, Jerry. <laughs> um, we made we worked on these pegs when we could get a moment of shade and. Um, and the raising was, of course, really spectacular to have um, one really powerful, another powerful component of this was really to have um, the entire university from across disciplines and from staff to chancellor to be really excited about this. It was a really amazing and beautiful opportunity. And um, we were really, really, really happy to have it um, for some days on our campus. Um, and here you see the, those sort of three places, of course, that we've talked about already. Um, and some of this kind of beautiful imagery of where of, of where it landed um, and some of the student work there at the building museum. And I think I'm going to again say thank you for everyone's time. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, so we are a few minutes over, but we had uh, promised to do a question and answer session so we can do that briefly. Um, and um, so do you have one question to get y'all started and um, anyone in the audience, please send them through the Q and a um, where did you source the wood for the truss and how did you transport the truss. You want to take that one Rick and Laura Brown. <laughs> okay, so um, the, um, the, you know, the, the, the first question the French asked us when we were uh, just you know, talking about doing this project was where were we going to source our trees? Because in France, they have forests that have go, they go back to the Middle Ages that have been managed to be sure. They always have a good inventory of high quality, well uh, managed uh, oak trees. So um, what we did is we, we uh, in, this, in the US, we have a lot of national forests, but they're not managed the same way they are in France. So uh, the, the best sources for good quality timber in the U.S. are from private sources. So one of our um, uh, uh, expert timber framers, um, Mez Welsh, uh, he's from Rockbridge County in Virginia. And what he did was he went around to a, lot, a good number of landowners. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure how many thousands of acres he actually accessed, but it was quite a lot. And, about, and, and a good number of owners who allowed him to uh, survey trees and, and select trees carefully so they weren't all coming from one location they were dispersed throughout the, uh, the mountainside and um, and so we uh, extracted those trees using uh, some of the trees were taken down using uh, you know felling axes and uh, as they would have been done you know back at the time the cathedral was originally built and then also some of the trees were removed from the forest using a uh, horses as a way of, of, of being more sensitive to how you remove a tree and not destroy the forest. But, uh, but the 30 trees that we use for this project came from, um, from a Rockbridge County in Lexington, Virginia. That's the short answer. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you transport the truss? Okay, so, so uh, actually after the truss is made, uh, then you have them you know, in, in smaller dimensions, but there's still a lot of wood. And so the truss comes apart and it's a, like a puzzle, if you will. And the pieces uh, are all moved on a 30 foot uh, gooseneck trailer. And by uh, a, and actually uh, the, the trailer is, uh, has to be pulled by a truck that can pull a gooseneck trailer. <laughs> so that's kind of the, uh, the challenges is, uh, is uh, 
having uh, they, they're moved that way by with a trailer and a truck and that, that's how they were brought to Atlanta and uh, and actually taken from Washington back to Lexington, Virginia, where they were stored um, actually in Mez Welch's uh, shop. And now it's um, uh, being uh, exhibited at the Millennium Gate Museum in Atlanta and it will be taken down and put back on that trailer very soon. <laughs> we have another question. How many trusses are required in total for the cathedral? Okay. Uh, I want to have Lindsay. <laughs> Lindsay, I feel like th this is an interesting question that's actually come up a lot for all of us. And so uh, between Jerry and Lindsay, uh, do you want to take that one on? Because it's not, it's, it, there's not, it's not a single question with a single answer. Jerry, why don't you go ahead first, please? Um, I, I know more about the choir. And that That's are. sort of what I was going to say is I would have to actually look back and the other sort of piece of this um, to answer this question is we've been looking, I think, exclusively, maybe, Jerry, there was one moment where you were showing a secondary truss, but just for everyone else that we've mostly been looking at primary trusses. So it sort of depends on what you're asking um, is, you know, to include those or not to include them. Um, but we do know there are 13 uh, primary trusses in the choir specifically, and I would have to look back to answer that for the nave. And also to just echo, I'm so glad that Jerry corrected my, my mistake about the nave versus choir of Carpenters Without Borders. And the fact that every single, just to reiterate that every single primary truss is distinct. Um, and we've recently learned that that's how they're also going to be restored, which is I think, a really um, beautiful piece of this to be able to sort of maintain the sense of history about this when it's when it's restored at the end of, of 2024. Well, there are no other questions coming in. If anyone in the audience has any more questions, I'm happy to forward them to our panelists, but I am going to go ahead and close the discussion and give a very big thank you to Rick and Laura, Marie, Tanya, Lindsay, and Gerald. Thank you so much for joining the Wilson Center for our Global Georgia Speaker Series. It was wonderful. Thank you again. And thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you Winnie. Thank you very much. And please come see us at the exhibit in, in Atlanta. It will be up until Sunday or Monday, the 25th. It will be coming down April 25th. But come and see the, there's a closing exhibition on the 24th. And we'd love to have you. Thank you.